Hello, welcome to Future Left Podcast. I'm Adam Simpson here with Casey Rogers. Casey, how you doing? Man, the government. I know. We're here to talk about the government today. Today we got a special episode uh, with uh, one Ford Fisher, a libertarian gentleman. Uh, I, a, I used to drive a Ford Fisher. No, you didn't. You son of a bitch. No, I did. Couldn't no. afford a Ford Fisher. But uh, no, he's a, he's a good guy. Uh, he's re- kind enough to reach out to us. Wanted to be on the program. We're happy to have him. Future Left, obviously, we talk about future things. We're a bunch of uh, dirty anarcho Trotskyite uh, Zizekians. I think I think is what we are. No, we're not that. But uh, no, we're a bunch of dirty leftists, and we talk about the future like uh, like robots and stuff. A lot of our mission is to articulate a vision about what the future might look like. We're having a Ford on because he he's he wants to talk about kind of a, what a libertarian's view of society is. And even though we we uh, we uh, likely disagree on a lot, um, you know, I'm I'm very much interested in different perspectives on uh, absolutely yeah uh, on, on how we organize society. And uh, what I really appreciate about the conversation is that um, it's about a, a complete reordering. You know what I mean? It's not. It's, I feel like there is a vision there, and I disagree with the vision in a lot of ways. I guess, but uh, it, it it's not moored in like this is the shitty system we got what are we going to do about this you know what i mean right, i feel like yeah. a lot of politics gets bogged down and like the obstacles a lot of main a lot of mainstream politics that, that's that, yeah. that's the most mainstream politics seems to be like let's work with things exactly the way they are now yeah yeah, yeah. Or like, oh, you know, that it's just always going to be this way. It's always going to be right, like yeah. this. It's always going to be like that. So I appreciate that about the, the conversation we had with Ford. It's very much about like what could be rather than about what uh, is and necessarily has yeah, to be. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of uh, thinking outside the box. And obviously, uh, you know, libertarianism, there is a school of thought there, but it's thinking outside the box of a lot of what is standard practice right now, which I, which I know we appreciate. Yeah, yeah, and I, I definitely want to say that it was very much a conversation. It was a good exchange. Um, I, I suspect we'll have uh, libertarians and, and our, our usual audience listening. Uh, and just so you know, if you're looking for one of these ridiculous clickbait stuff like, uh, you know, Ford Fisher eviscerates leftist asshole, that's really not what's going to happen here. It's, it's mostly going to be mutual listening. It's an exchange. We, I mean, we disagreed on, on things, but it was very much a, a, an exchange rather than yeah. like a... And there was never any point where someone was like proven wrong and then I played a sound out of a bullhorn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should we should look into that though you know? we should oh no. shit <laughs> yeah I think that I mean we're not going to do the news today we're just going to jump right into the conversation so the conversation it, it, it was a, a little bit philosophical at times I mean uh, there was a you know Ford approached libertarianism with a, a kind of he started out by talking about a deontological argument and uh that's uh, it's, it's nice, you know. Uh, a lot of the stuff I read, a lot of times, it's not like there's not like a coherent system behind it. And while I disagree with it, kind of, I, I feel like the rule was a little rigid. This non-aggression principle, and I'll let Ford define that as he does in the uh, in the conversation. But um, you know, it's philosophical, it was political, it was economic. It had, there was there was yeah. a lot to this. There wasn't a lot of what there is in mainstream politics uh, or in our mainstream discourse today, which is people saying this is common sense. It means you can interpret it however you want to, and uh, there's no real systematic way of, of thinking there, no discipline to it. And so, yeah, that's what I I, I learned some. Because honestly, normally when I think about libertarians, I think about like Milton Friedman was like, yeah. you just you just take everything from everyone and let people just kind of starve. Or, you know, because that's the free market and they starve. I, I mean, that's my perception of libertarianism. Uh, this is, yeah, yeah, yeah. The kind of like, oh, well, you just, you just poor people are supposed to be poor because they're awful. Obviously, we, we, we can let people, we people die, and that'll that'll clear out the race. Yeah, and that's that's really the not human race. Yeah, normally libertarianism, uh, it's it's just very. Uh it's overly about the free market. We definitely talked about the role of government a lot. And, uh, you know, that's that was part of the non-aggression principle conversation. The role of what? Government. Oh, OK. Got that. GD that. government. And with that, I think we'll go directly to our conversation with Ford Fisher. We'll see you next week, everybody. Bye bye. And joining us now is Mr. Ford Fisher here to give us uh, an alternative perspective on all of our futury lefty tomfoolery that we do here. Ford, how are you, how are you doing today? Thanks for joining us. Doing quite well. Glad to be here. 
So just a little bit about Ford. Uh, Ford is a co-founder, managing editor, executive producer of news to share.com, a bipartisan news organization. He's also uh, works as a video videographer at uh, the nonprofit Tax Revolution Institute and uh, previously worked at Reason Magazine, Fox News and the Moving Picture Institute. Uh, he joins us uh, fresh off uh, a lot of experience with the libertarian movement, including the national convention and uh, the debate between uh, various candidates. I'm really happy for you to be here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And uh, let me just say just, um, you know, obviously we're a bunch of dirty, dirty uh Bolsheviks, or not Bolsheviks, but you know what I mean. We're just a bunch of dirty leftists. What was that? So I don't know, but I, I like a good Bolshevik reference. What are you going to do? We, but we do. Uh, we get a sense yeah. that uh, a lot of people today in politics they don't really get outside their own bubble, or when they do, it's it's often hostile and predatory. So and and really, uh, this is a, like a unique opportunity. This campaign season with uh, ch- you know Trump and Hillary not well liked by quite a lot of people, and I know Gary Johnson, the Libertarian candidate, is really interested in uh, kind of uh, getting it in with uh, voters that are dissatisfied with the two-party system. Right, absolutely. And uh, in particular, he's emphasizing a lot the point that he has probably more than two-thirds of his positions that Bernie Sanders supporters get behind. And so he emphasizes the common ground between the deep leftists, uh, the Bolsheviks, as you sort of (laughs) self-deprecatingly just said, um, uh, and the libertarians. Uh, A lot of the difference comes down to where those ideas come from, but then they end up with a lot of common ground. And so I think that that'll be really interesting to delve into today. Yeah, I think so, too. And just to be clear, uh, we we do identify as uh, non-gender conforming Maoists, not not Bolshevik, j- just to be perfectly clear. <laughs> I see. Yeah. But no. Uh, but uh, no. Uh, so this conversation uh, is largely uh, started by uh, this shitty article I wrote in May. Uh, it's called, it's called uh, Big I- Big Ideas Need Big Government. It was provocatively titled for obvious reasons. And uh, yeah. I was, it was successful in uh, provoking you, which I'm happy, which I was very happy about. But basically, the main thesis of the paper um, was about challenges like climate change, uh, big endeavors like high-speed rail or uh, or something like that, that government leadership is required rather than just government involvement. And I wanted to give you a chance to, to push back on that and give us your own view of what the, the role of government is uh, appropriately uh, right. from, from a libertarian perspective, I suppose. So I was basically provoked to uh, have this conversation by Adam's article, Big Ideas Need Big Government. And so before getting into sort of uh, liberalism, leftism, progressivism versus libertarianism, uh, I want to define what those terms mean and how they're different. So a libertarian, briefly put, is somebody who adheres to the non-aggression principle, and they believe in that both personally and politically. And the non-aggression principle basically states that it is always wrong to initiate force, fraud, or coercion against another person. What that means is uh, it's different from uh, nonviolence in that somebody can defend themselves because uh, if somebody else aggresses upon you, then uh, you're not initiating force. And so you can use force to defend yourself, but that it's always wrong to initiate force. Basically, when they look at the government, the government itself is funded by force. Taxation is created by force and that all of the rules that the government imposes are by force. They're not optional. And the police, the military, what have you, are the enforcers of it. So they look at basically every law in the context of does this law adhere to the non-aggression principle? Does it enforce the non-aggression principle? Uh, or does it violate it in and of itself? So they can look at virtually any issue and say, are we adhering to the NAP or not? And in practice, the end result of a libertarian is that their policies tend to be fiscally conservative, meaning that they want to minimize the amount of force that they use when it comes to taxes, the market, et cetera, that they want to uh, minimize force. They tend to be socially liberal because social liberals tend to, in general, want the least amount of force injected into what people do with their personal lives, be it marriage or or drug use, etc. And they tend to be anti-war uh, because war itself is aggression. And so the only legitimate war in the mind of a libertarian is one that is truly defensive, is one where they have not initiated it. And theoretically, if every if every country followed this, you would never have any war. But it's a fundamentally American idea so far. The libertarian movement is growing quite a bit in America. 
And so they pretty much would like to start there before finding some kind of global liberty. To lay out the difference between libertarian and progressive, although they have an enormous amount of common ground, there's a lot of difference in the motivation. Libertarians and progressives both generally agree with legalizing drug use, so I'll use that as an example as I go through this. Libertarianism has a deontological motivation, and that's to say liberty is inherently right and violating liberty is inherently wrong. Deontological, uh, basically meaning we're starting at cause rather than effect. The actual act of violating liberty is inherently wrong, not just because it ends up with a bad outcome, but because it's it's wrong to violate somebody's liberty in the first place. It also, well, I, I guess, I guess. Uh, I don't know that taxation, uh, in my mind, doesn't constitute as as a violation of liberty. I mean, it, 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 in a certain sense, that tax, taxes and you know our relationship to uh, our various government, in a sense, it's it's almost like paying to be a part of a society, and that might be controversial. It might be a, a, some some sort of violation of the non-aggression principle. But I, I guess you know when you take, and maybe this is because you know uh, of a, a consequentialist view, but is it if you take a little bit in taxes and you you do do good with it in terms of social good, I don't know that it um, it doesn't strike me as harm. I don't know, or at the very least, it's not right. net harm, if that makes sense. Right. And so this was what I was going to lay out: is that the progressive, as opposed to the libertarian, who deontologically says, firstly, we should, we have to enforce liberty because it's inherently right. They then also have secondarily the consequentialist motivation that they think that their belief is that free markets and free minds, uh, that libertarianism actually leads to the best result. The progressive is is much more purely consequentialist, which, like you said, is to say that their motivation is about the end goal. A libertarian thinks it's inherently wrong to collect taxes and that it has a bad result. The progressive doesn't say it's inherently good to collect taxes. If you if you were to uh, have the ability to to just right. take money from Bill Gates, but then the money wouldn't do anything good, you just sort of burned it. Uh, you wouldn't just do that to punish the rich. <laughs> the reason why you're taxing is is because you believe that you can do good with it. So you have a consequentialist motivation for yeah. progressive policies. Take all of Bill Gates's money and give it to Elon Musk. That's my plan. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to social policy, it's it's similarly it's a different motivation. Both libertarians and progressives may agree on legalizing drug use, right? We would probably agree that marijuana should not be illegal and that there's all kinds of negative consequences to right. criminalizing marijuana, the drug war in particular. But the libertarian would say there's no the government doesn't have the right to stop somebody from using drugs in the first place. They're not violating somebody else's liberty. If the if the drug user is not initiating force against another person, we have no right to stop them from doing what they're doing in the first place. The progressive probably says they would maybe agree with that, but their premise is more based on there's a net negative both to that person and to society when there is drug criminalization, that that's basically going to end up with a net negative. And so that's their motivation for it being legal. And so both of those arguments are equally true, but I think that it's interesting to lay out the difference there. I think that if a progressive felt that you could enforce drug laws and that it would be a net positive on society, many progressives would then be in favor of it, whereas a libertarian would say, even if it was helping society to keep it criminal, we don't have the right to do that in the first place. If I don't have a right as an individual, I can't delegate that right to the government. I don't have the right to use force against a drug user. I can't go take somebody's pot and put them in a cage myself, right? Me with with a gun and handcuffs or something. Right. So how can I delegate that right to somebody else? And that's the sort of psychological difference at play. I don't have a problem with uh, the the same reasons by which uh, you wouldn't criminalize drugs. That someone's personal personal freedom and personal choices that don't harm anyone else. I'm, I'm fine with that, I guess. And maybe this is some sort of cognitive dissonance, uh, you, you, you may say. I just don't transfer it over to something like taxes or like subsidies or social programs and things like that. Right. And so some people would, again, the, many of the purists would say, OK, taxation is inherently wrong. We should get rid of all of it. Most libertarians would say we should get in the direction of privatizing and lowering taxes in general because it's forced we should try to minimize it, not that we should just try to abolish 
abolish the entire institution overnight. But I think there, there's a fundamental question, and this is, this is one to which uh, you and a libertarian might have a different answer, which is, very simply put, is taxation theft? And if it's not theft, why? I don't think taxation is theft is because, is because being a part of society, you pay in taxes, you get social services often, or you paying into, uh, you know, uh, part of property taxes is you're paying into the local school district. You may not have kids, but you get to grow, you get to live in a society without uh, with people that have education. Yeah, um, if, so, if, a, if a guy came and stole your wallet and then used the money in your wallet to support you, um, I, I think that would be different than it'd be a head scratcher. Uh, it'd be, be different than had, it would be different than how right. theft usually works, which is where he yeah. takes it and then, and then he just uses your money. You, usually, the 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 defense of taxation is not theft tends to be, and this is the exact difference, it tends to be a consequentialist motivation. It tends to be, well, but we're using the money to do something good, therefore it wasn't theft in the first place. And so you kind of have this cause-effect, chicken and egg mix-up that I'm sure I couldn't convince you right now that taxation is theft, but the, moti but the motivation that it wasn't theft in the first place seems to be about what was done with it later. In You're the mind right. of a libertarian, the question would be, is it voluntary in the first place? And so in order to make taxation more voluntary, there's the ideas of certain of certain things that can certain types of taxes that can be done voluntarily or based on actual usage. Gary Johnson's argument on who will build the roads is the common question of non-libertarians. His, he, he would answer that you can fund highways using a gas tax because that's more of a, that's basically a usage fee or toll roads are a are a type of tax based on actual usage mm -hmm. and that many other and similarly many other things can be voluntary and the more local something is the more voluntary it happens to be because the democracy tends to be more effective on a local level than on a federal level. And just to clarify, by usage-based, you mean instead of taxing everybody for a service that everybody may not use, only the people who are using it are paying for it when they use it. Many Right. So many people would try to push in that direction, whether it's right when they use it. I, as an example, on the local level, where I grew up in Massachusetts, we had a, a pretty small town, and we actually had a garbage collection uh, system that was not... Um, uh, fully socialized. It was it was administered by the town, but you had to buy these stickers. For two dollars, you'd you'd buy a, a, a red sticker that you'd put on the top of a trash bag, and so that was how you basically paid for it. Uh, mm. It was government mm. administered, but it's voluntary. If you don't, if if you want to go deposit your find somewhere else to deposit your trash that doesn't violate someone else's uh, rights. It's definitely, can't throw in the local river. Yeah. Right. It's definitely a violation of, of you know, non-aggression to just yeah. throw it in your neighbor's yard or into a river. But if you have some other way of disposing of it, you know, so be it. So that's I mean, basically a, what I would give as an example of a voluntary system. What I would do is I would empty out my neighbor's trash bags and put my trash in his bags with a sticker on it. That's how I'd play where, it. Where would you put his trash? In his yard. <laughs> no, no. His, <laughs> yeah, not gonna, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, like a, that, he, he, that's he definitely at least that. <laughs> no, no, well, no. But what you were saying, or what you were saying earlier, I, just going back to this, when, when I said that if a guy stole your wallet and then used it so, to support you, that wouldn't be theft. That's obviously not true. That would still be theft, and you'd be like, "I can do those things for myself. Thank you very much. I, I don't need you forcibly taking right. my things." So yeah, I can yeah. see where that that falls well, through. I guess part of my reaction to to that idea um, is that we have a representational government, on, and you know, I, I'm sure we both agree that it doesn't work properly. But there's an accountability structure, however flawed, and we should fix those flaws. But I don't know that in theory, and, and, there's account an accountability structure in theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, it's it's compromised in a lot of different ways. But I don't know that we get to a a better society by cutting these social programs. I think we both agree that the government can be and certainly is is inefficient at times, but I just don't think that minimizing it will make society better. In terms of the role that it's able to have, the question I would ask you is it, you, you basically say, okay, an individual can't steal someone's wallet and then sustain them with it. You, we both agree that that's theft. The que my question would be, if you don't have the right to do that in the first place in a representative government, theoretically, if we live in a democracy, if, if that's how it's supposed to work, then essentially we're delegating rights to the state to do various things, right? right? I have the right to defend myself. Therefore, I can delegate to the state the right to defend me. Can I delegate that right to the state, which I don't have in the first place? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it's part of a social contract. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, right. Uh, so long as there is a, a, a democratic process, you know, we have a constitution to form the bones and kind of the, the bumpers of that bowling alley, I guess, where, where things can't go too far one way or another. 
I guess that's my perspective on it. I think generally, so de- democracy is a beautiful idea. I love participating in democracy. Sure. The, the flaw that it has is that people can vote into opinions that are violations of liberty. And so I, I right. see well, that's, that's fiscal what policy and social policy is inextricably linked. One of the most important moments, actually, in my evolution on thinking about government was actually talking to a friend of mine who's a Democrat. He was my roommate freshman year of, of college, and he, he was gay, and he was talking. we were talking about gay marriage. And I said something to the effect of, well, the majority of the country believes in gay marriage. I don't understand how we don't just put this to a vote and then lay the issue to rest. And he said, I don't want people to vote on my rights. He said, I want this to be a Supreme Court issue because I don't want the fact that the majority believe in it to be the reason I can do it. It's inherent that there's nothing wrong with gay marriage, so I should be able to get married regardless of whether the majority believe in it. And that very much changed my mindset. And so, again, progressives would probably agree with that on social policy. The the same thing may be true of fiscal policy, which is uh, just because the majority says that it seems like a good idea doesn't mean that it's inherently something that they had the right to do. Similarly, I, I guess my evolution, uh, I think, is relevant as well. I I became very skeptical of the quote unquote free market because I worked in a bar where you depend on basically someone giving you extra money, which right. So I, I became very skeptical of the free market system. And then uh, because I work on Middle East po- foreign policy most of the time, I became very skeptical of the government. So I was very nearly just a, a dirty, dirty anarchist but uh, uh, because of so- issues like climate change or, um, or, or or large challenges that I don't think that individuals uh, in vol- voluntary syndicates or, or whatever structure we're going to we're going to build I don't think that they can meet problems like that and that's why I think you do especially in times of crisis which uh, you know we had a whole episode on, on climate change pessimism but that issue in particular made me very concerned about how do we get to uh, a, a solution regarding issues as big as that and right. f- from a no government no fr- no market situation and I, or or, uh, or less of the two it was was was, right. it was kind of my perspective on it you, you have people that are pretty within the libertarian movement that vastly vary on that so i remember one of the things that stuck out when i was at the libertarian uh debate was that austin peterson when asked about climate change said i don't know if climate change is real but i know the government should stay the hell out of it that was his exact answer and you know, that sounded a little verbose to me. First yeah. of all, climate change is real. Uh, like, there's no... Yay! I, I <laughs> right. And it, sh- and it shouldn't be, a, like, a radical thing to say that. I mean, this is a science fact. I think that reasonable people can disagree on the solutions to that. But you can't... If you're, if you're starting off from saying, I disagree with, with pretty much unanimously agreed science then it, it sort of illegitimizes the rest of your positions on on that topic. Yeah. So climate change is real. The question is what to do about it. And I think that adherence to the non-aggression principle would say that there is a legitimate role of the government in some cases, but the question is exactly how much. Rand Paul actually talked about this, which is that generally speaking, you can't just put a bunch of pollutants into a river. We would agree that it's aggression to, to grossly pollute. But we also don't think that cars should be illegal because they have some small amount of emissions. What that means is that somewhere in the middle, there is a line at which we have to either criminalize or uh, remove externalities by taxing a certain behavior, but basically that we have to regulate it in some way. I don't know the exact answer to this, but I, my feeling is that the, the libertarian opinion is that we should basically defend people's property rights because if my if I live next door to my neighbor, he pollutes, he pollutes, and then I end up with less clean air that he has done harm to me. And so there is a legitimate role of the government in discouraging that from happening. It's but- important to note, though, that the U.S. government is the largest polluter in the entire world. Uh, specifically the DOD, right? Ford, can I right. ask you a, a quick That's question? Right. You, you just you just mentioned your neighbor uh, polluting polluting the air. What, what are you, uh, what is your uh, what are your feelings on uh, smoking bans? Because right. that's sort so, of a that's sort of a micro version of this. Again, I would probably agree that that's a right, like exactly like you just said. I think it's a micro version. The Federal government and the states certain, certainly should have no ability to ban smoking universally in their areas. However, um, so I actually, I went to a university that had a debate over a smoking ban about halfway through, and they ended up banning smoking on my entire college campus. And I, my, I was actually in favor of, and this was not an option on the list. I'm always the third option. I never like either side of any issue. Sure. Um, <laughs> right. This is the libertarian. Opinion. My, I, I actually was in favor of they should 
if they're going to ban smoking, they should have designated smoking areas. I felt like it's probably not a good idea to say you have to go all the way off campus in the middle of the night if you have to have yeah. a cigarette. But at the same time, yeah, it's kind of annoying when you walk right by somebody and, and they blow smoke and it ends up in your face. Yeah. Right. I think that my solution, first of all, is I don't know all the answers to everything. But generally, yeah, my yeah. solution would be that it should be a question that is so locally talked about that it's actually possible for a college campus to discuss it. I think it's good that the student body is able to discuss that. And it wasn't yeah. the District of Columbia that told my school, you have to ban smoking on campus. My girlfriend goes to Georgetown. They've, they've had smoking banned for a while. That makes sense. They have a hospital on their campus. Yeah. Uh, and same with the NIH campus, which is a, basically a hospital and research area as well. Right. I think there are certain very, like very local contexts where you can where you can regulate that kind of thing and where it may make sense. But the higher up that role is, the larger, whether it's sta uh, city, state, federal government, the higher that goes, the less likely it's going to be to adhere to what people want and the more likely it'll be to uh, aggress on their liberty. Right. Because that's well, the, because that, because the higher it goes, the less connected it is to the actual specific context. Right. And and the less democratic it is. If you if the entire west half of the United States wants smoking to be there, the entire east half wants to ban it and they get 51 percent of the vote. Is there any reason that the west half that Californians shouldn't smoke, even if they unanimously want it? The more the closer you get to the individual, the more freedom that you have. So just to get back to the climate change issue. So I'm curious what a free market solution that looks like. And I know you mentioned property rights, but I feel like the pollution goes so far beyond that. And most of the time, like I, I've suggested previously on the podcast, uh, I've talked about a carbon tax and uh, and stuff like that. Yeah. So I'm wondering what, what and, and in a certain way, that's a market solution. It's not, I mean, we're, we're, we're uh, injecting taxes into the market and penalizing people for using X, Y, and Z, or maybe subsidizing this. Right. Um, but how do you view such proposals? So right. the, the reason that, and again, there are some libertarians who, like Austin Peterson said, would, would say, stay the hell out of it. But when you think about a carbon tax, the, the reason why it makes sense, the justification for it is if a company has this negative byproduct that they're externalizing, if somebody is doing damage to the environment and it doesn't hurt their own profits, then there's a, there may be a financially measurable amount of damage that they're doing to others, even if that others is the other six billion people on Earth. Right. And so if you can figure out what that damage is, I, th I think that it can make sense to impose a tax proportional to that on the company. The issue is if a company has more money than God, does it, how much does it, does it actually right. matter? Right. Yeah, and, and in the same way, when I when I talk about a carbon tax, you know the the amount of subsidies that oil companies or whatever company or, or agribusiness or something or these people get, mm -hmm. like maybe we should start there rather than going with a carbon tax. Right. So we have to remember that the market is perverted, I would use the word, as a result of cronyism to begin with. And this is probably something we'd also agree on is that there's so much corporate welfare that is a result, in my opinion, I would call corporate welfare big government. But when you have the, the government picking winners and losers, that can offset the financial issues that they have as a result of doing damage. Right. Sure. If, if all these people say, we want to take away our support, we're, we're going to boycott this company, and the government says, don't worry about it, we're going to keep giving you money, then the company is not going to change its behavior. Yeah. I think that uh, what I would probably call democratic capitalism, and I'm sure you've heard this term, works, which is to say, if people actually realize that the environment is is going to hell and we've got to do something about it, and they and they can point out this and that company are the ones responsible, people can pull their support. Boy boycotts do work. Companies respond to profits. And so government can try to take away their profits with a tax like that. But at the end of the day, if individuals, if 300 million individuals in the country actually pull support from a company and are aware of it, I think that that can do more damage to them yeah. than, oh, we're just going to pay this tax well, under the table yeah, of the that, state. Well, that's going that, to necessitate the depoliticization uh, depoliticization of uh, science, science, basically. That's right. why I, I don't think a lot of Americans are ready to fall in behind that because you still well, have so many Americans that say the science just isn't in. Uh, even, right. even beyond that, though, what, what concerns me is like most people, you know, they, they go to work, they get they, you know, pick up their kids from school, they make dinner. And most people don't follow issues probably as closely as you or I do, um, for better or worse. That's my sense. And that might be an elitist view, maybe. Part of the free market ethos is that people make rational decisions pay, based on the information they have. And I think the problem is that oftentimes people don't have enough information or a lot of times people will act opposite to their own rational self-interest. That's what makes me skeptical about such a solution. I guess. You seem to know about this issue quite a bit, and you started a podcast, uh, right? <laughs> yeah. So I, I assume that you would, you'd hope that 
maybe some Hillary Clinton Democrats will pick up this podcast and maybe they'll be convinced of your opinion. I, Those I'm people can maybe, go to hell. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> right. People, people generally want new people into their point of view, right? Yeah, the libertarians yeah. right now are really trying to court Bernie Sanders supporters because they have so much common ground. Right. So getting people into your point of view is, is actually a good thing. And if you actually care about this issue and you do, then part of your prerogative would be to go and get people to actually believe in it. One of the mantras that, that was taught to me by a good friend, Dan Johnson, who started People Against the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, he says, good ideas don't require force. It's a very it's a very simple mantra, but it does make sense. If you have a really good idea, you don't need government guns to enforce it. You need to get people to agree with that idea. You need to get people to believe in it. I, I just feel like as polarized as politics is right now, that, that you're really bordering on sounding like a, a true Maoist, Adam, uh, when, you, when you say that, like, I feel like, uh, but I almost agree with you that uh, I mean, I mean, when you talk about, you know, Hillary Clinton, I, I have a lot of problems with Hillary Clinton, but like anytime I talk about this, when I mean, my family's from, from down south in, te in Texas, every time I talk, I talk about Hillary, they're all like, oh, Benghazi. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> like, 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 I don't know. What about not, Benghazi? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, right. I, I feel like politics is, is so, I don't know. It's, it's just people are in their own echo chamber. They're not really, they're not really listening or I don't know. So yeah. I, no, you're right. this is only a political issue, though, because we're talking about it as it relates to the government. Basically, other issues that the government that people pretty much don't think of as government issues don't end up getting politicized. As soon as we introduce, okay, the government's going to deal with environmental regulations, now we've got 50% of the country against and 50% of the country for, and now it's going to be a really slow thing to overturn. If the government wasn't the people that wasn't the thing that people look to for environmental issues, this wouldn't be politicized. Right now, Republicans will just oppose anything that Obama does. Obama could say, I want to, um, I'm going to make Ronald Reagan's ghost the Supreme Court nominee, and <laughs> Republicans would be would be against it just because it's Obama saying so. But if this wasn't in the context of government and policy, I'm pretty sure most cons conservatives, people in the in the South, they're in rural, more rural areas. They they see woods a lot more, and yeah. they and they go hunting. My right, fam the, my family's from the woods, so those people may be more likely to have a sympathy towards the environment itself. But as soon as you politicize it, then then you've lost half the country. Like so we did an episode about climate change pessimism, just because I think we might be doomed. I mean, that, that seems like a possibility to me. That like we. Re <laughs> Yeah. A we reach a tipping point, the the glaciers disappear, the oceans turn into acid, or whatever, whatever, and, <laughs> right. and we're just all dead. So and I, I try not to be that guy, but I can get really down when I read too much about climate change. And and, and maybe that's why I've become very status, especially on this issue, is that I'm like, look, someone's needed, you know, Jesus ain't going to take the wheel. Damn it, we need someone to take the wheel. Oh, we, we need to start making changes. Like, you know, you'd think that sustainability would be something that that people would naturally choose, but then people go out and they buy an iPhone, buy a new iPhone every year. I mean, you know, this is a conversation I feel like we could have all day. And I do want to move to economy, but I want to give sure. you the la last word and re respond to that. I, I would just say, so I actually read an entire paper for a class that I had that was based on the fact that people's views on the environment actually change uh, politically when you when you think about uh, language. So the words global warming and climate climate change are ones that the left responds to positively, and uh, there's a knee jerk reaction from the right when you talk about water cleanliness and com community preservation, when you talk about preserving the forests, for example, you actually find that conservatives are more likely than liberals to respond positively to those initiatives. Yeah. Um, so the, the thing that I've that I've learned from that from that piece is that the motivations aren't so different. You're not going to find Republicans who say we want to destroy the environment. Nobody does. But it's but it's because of the politicization. And when we think about pol politicization, we're talking about policy. We're talking about the state. When you introduce something to the state, then it becomes contentious. I actually think this issue would be easier to solve uh, if people did not think of it in that context. No, it's just, you know, it, that's also something that's always interested me. They say that, like, politicians, like, the word usage thing. You know, in my mind, you may like, you know, preserving the ocean more than you like the word climate change. But you'd think extinction would be something you'd be, you know, just naturally concerned about, regardless of political affiliation. Right, and again, there's a knee-jerk reaction from, from the right on saying, oh, well, that's just, like, liberal hogwash, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Extinction, right? They, sure. they say, oh, that's yeah. extreme, and so now we can't. So now you've lost well, but, that, that kind well, of person. But, well, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but terms describing reality become uh, become buzzwords so quickly now in, in our yeah, political right. climate that, that even if you started using things like water cleanliness, then people are going to start saying, oh, here comes that water cleanliness thing again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just like with community organi organizing. Here comes, here comes the Brita filter lobby. They were saying Obama <laughs> was a community organizer, and pretty soon people were like, oh, 
community organizer. I'm like, <laughs> what, what, are you, what are you talking about? You yeah. can just say it with air quotes and then be like. I do want to move into the economy. I'm sure we both agree po- poverty is bad. You know, I'm yes, gonna, poverty I'm gonna, is bad. I'm going to go on a limb ground. and I'm going to fall on yeah. my sword and say poverty is bad. <laughs> um, but uh, we probably have diff- different ideas about how to, to correct it. In particular, you know, reading the libertarian platform, watching the debate, I got, I got a sense that there's a lot of faith in the free market that I've lost for different reasons. I want you to give your, your perspective on how we address people who A, live in poverty currently, and B, how, how we create a society whereby people can get out of it easier. Right. I think that, again, there is this there is the difference between the consequentialist and the deontological question. There There is, firstly, what do we even have the right to do as a government about this? If Even if we could get everybody out of poverty by shooting Bill Gates, do we have the right and, and giving all the poor people his money? Do we have the right to do that? It might make a better world, says the consequentialist. Yeah. The deontologi- deontological thinker says, well, we still don't have the right to shoot Bill Gates. So, I mean, sure. I would start off I by mean, saying that there's a difference. I, I, I would agree. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. <laughs> we, we all agree that you shouldn't, build, you shouldn't shoot Bill Gates and redistribute as well. Just shoot Melinda For Gates. now. For now. Right. Well, if you ask the right wing, they'd be like, well, we could. Sh- I think about vote, uh, voting to shoot George Soros, right? The- <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so there's the question of what do you have the right to do in the first place? What we would agree that people do definitely have the right to do is we do have the right to attempt free solutions. You do have the right to give a homeless person money or food. Right. We would we would agree that people have the right to do that in the first place. The, the question is, what should the state do? But I do want to start on that common ground. And, and I think both of us would agree on there are these rules in various cities that actually forbid feeding the homeless. I think we would both agree that that's totally outrageous. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a violation of the homeless person and the other person's right to have a free yeah. transaction with one another. Well, it's, it's based um, on this silly idea that like if you force them to leave the city, then you solve the problem, which is not right. which is which, not problem solving, That's which basic. at best displaces the issue and exactly. at right. worst yeah. keeps them in the city, but turns them also into criminals rather than yeah. just the right homeless people. But so there's this question of what what should the state do in the first place? My opinion is that the biggest issue that the government has with regards to redistribution is actually towards the top, not the bottom. When we talk about the social safety net, trying to cut welfare to cut the government budget or to cut taxes is like trimming your nails to lose weight. <laughs> when you get rid of gov- government subsidies to big ag, when you get rid of various tax incentives to to really large corporations where they end up with a lower um, a, a tax rate than you or I do effectively. Um, corporate welfare is so much larger than individual wel- welfare. And so Rand, Rand Paul actually talked about this when he was running for president. And I'm referencing Rand's not even a true conservative or a libertarian. He's kind of a libertarian-ish, he usually describes himself as, or a Republican, yeah. libertarian, whatever. Sure. But his libertarian premise, which that. I basically think most libertarians would agree with, is I won't cut one penny from from the welfare state until we've actually eliminated all of the corporate welfare. So essentially that there's bigger fish to fry. All of that being said, one of the arg- arguments that some libertarians have, have softened up to is actually the basic income, and I'm sure your audience knows about this, but oh, the idea yeah. of basic income is that rather than doing individual pro- poverty programs, say food stamps, welfare checks in some areas, workfare checks, checking whether people are doing drugs or not. There's this idea of, okay, why don't we give everybody, usually the number's 10,000 bucks. Why don't we just give every single person in the country, rich, poor, whatever, $10,000, and then and then you start from there. When you ask most libertarians about that, it's actually kind of a, like, it's, it seems like a crazy proposal. And I remember when someone mentioned that to me first, I was my knee-jerk reaction was, that's completely ludicrous. Right. However, that's all, I mean, that's, that's exactly how it struck me the first time I heard about it. So when it when it actually was framed to me in this way. So first of all, when you say, ask a libertarian about this, here's the phrasing you can use that will that might attract them to it, which is uh, it's a negative income tax. Yeah, <laughs> that it's actually just starting your That's tax brilliant. bill. Actually at negative $10,000. And so people immediately will be more likely to come behind that. And if you happen to make no taxable income, then you get to keep all of it. In practice, somebody only getting $10,000 a year is not going to have the most fortuitous life, right? They can survive. They probably won't have to be homeless. They probably can eat and live, not comfortably, but they can survive without wondering if they're able to eat tomorrow. But generally, they're still going to want to work. And then the amount, that $10,000 that's just handed to them would dissipate as 
as they start making money on their own. So I do think that there's a libertarian case for reform in that sense yeah. and that it would also vastly simplify everything else. So libertarians, in addition to just saying we want to sort of cut cut all of this, there's often an emphasis on simplification. One of the biggest issues is that the tax code is so convoluted. I would in, invite people to go to taxrevolution.us. I do uh, some video for them and they talk a lot about how the IRS is getting too much power and how the tax code is so complicated. With such a tax uh, complicated tax code, that can really disadvantage people. With such a complicated welfare system, people end up in, in different areas. A libertarian, in addition to just saying, oh, maybe we should abolish all taxes or l even lower taxes, simplification is also a positive thing. So many of them will advocate a flat tax or a fair tax, which is basically a tax on consumption. Yeah. Those are both regressive as compared to the progressive taxes that we have right now. Right. But as it relates to welfare, rather than welfare, where there's all these expenses with how to verify verify that somebody is eligible, verify that they're looking for work. In some states, verifying that they're not using drugs, which is more expensive than the amount that they actually cut by doing that. Right. If you just start, if you do the basic income, it, it would probably lower costs uh, overall and generally raise quality of life. So I'm, well, I'm not necessarily in favor of it, but I think that as social safety net is concerned, it's probably better than what we have now. I definitely want to get to the basic income in a second, but just re regarding just in general our perspective on the social safety net, yeah, there was there was a story that animated me this past week, and it's a little bit different because it doesn't deal with specifically social safety net. But Mark Cuban, uh, Dallas's rich, 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 rich person, he yes, gave he, he gave a million dollars to and pr and he wants to be Hillary Clinton's running mate. So this is going to be crazy. No, <laughs> but he gave a million dollars to the local Dallas Police Department to basically fund special protection for LGBT people after the Orlando shooting last week. And right. really that, uh, like, at first I was like, oh, what a nice guy. And then I was like, I just got really pissed off. I was like, guys, the, this is your job, the police. You shouldn't be taking, it, it's not, it shouldn't be a charitable donation that gets a vulnerable right, community to protect it. Yeah, exactly. So it started pissing me off. But the, like when I was watching the, the libertarian debate, when, you know, a lot of the social safety net thing, was uh, like uh, who's going to take care of grandma everyone's going to take care of grandma some people don't have grandkids though and and like it turns out and you know there was talk about like I, I would help my neighbor that's great I'm sure we're you know we're all nice people we're all going to yeah. help our neighbor even still I feel like people fall through this the, like whatever charitable system that's based on donation and volunteerism I, I feel like we're still going to end up with with people in poverty in that situation Sure. I th and that and that is true. I do think that... Yeah, not just poverty, but like crippling, like, oh, what the hell are we going to do? The, the, that kind of poverty. I think that there, there are so many already nonprofit organizations trying to actually deal with this, that the libertarian argument would be that in addition to let's... Of course, everybody helps their loved ones. I would never let my parents or my grandparents just end up homeless, right? If I have the money to help them and they're homeless, then they then they would not be homeless anymore because I can help them. I'll also say um, that publicly. I don't know if I'd do it, but I'll say it publicly. I right. don't know if I would. Yeah. You don't, yeah, you don't know. Yeah. I, uh, I, got a, I got a few uncles. I'd let them go. You yeah, know? Right. Sure. Sure. Y'all are a bunch of communists, but you don't want them in your commune. You hey, want thank them in you. Like the, exactly. The, as long as I'm it's trying, the, the government commune, so you don't have to do it personally. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I'm trying I mean, to distance myself from my past. You know, they're getting up there. I mean, Soylent Green. I'm just going you know, to put it out there. Okay. So Soylent Green, Logan's Run. Logan's Run there. <laughs> there you go. People you turn go. T people, uh, whatever. Sorry, nerd yeah. references. But the point is, so those there are free market solutions. And I do think that when you do privatize slash, you know, um, uh, cut government issues, people do uh, step in. If the, the common example being, if we got rid of, if the government stopped being involved in roads, roads wouldn't cease to exist. The free market would fill in. I do think that you would have what I would call free market welfare. I'd probably be willing to personally donate to a welfare system if there was one that was voluntary and there wasn't a state one. I, I've donated this month to the World Wildlife Fund because uh, there isn't really a government World Wildlife Fund. But if that was being, t if that exact purpose was being taken out of my tax dollars, and no, the EPA doesn't count, uh, then I probably wouldn't have made that same donation. It does turn out that, and so I'm not advocating specifically churches, but churches do an enormous amount of community work on those sorts of things. And I do think that similarly, issues like subsidized housing, you would you would end up with others trying to fill that in. But if it we're seems talking to me about if we're talking about a representative government and the government is doing what we are delegating 
submitting to them, then theoretically, we would have been doing those things in the first place. We've just delegated that right to them. If the government stopped doing it, we would we would delegate it back to ourselves. And the, the libertarian would say that people people would figure it out. Yeah, I just I really don't see people delegating it back to themselves. I think that's kind of like the nice thing about delegating it to the government is that it, it does give people ex- in a, kind of an excuse to be less hands on with, well, with social delegate, issues. When you delegate, delegate it to the government, that makes it their job. Like that literally yeah. makes their their career so, is, to, is to do these mm-hmm. things instead of people in like the middle class and then in poverty or even the rich people have to, you know, think about. You know, how am I going to like sh- how much of my money do I donate for social good? It's something that the government makes a decision on. What, There's an accountability structure. But what incentive does the government have to actually do that job well that a nonprofit would not have uh, a nonprofit organization? They're not for profit. They're not for cash profit, but they do have a measure of success, which is are we succeeding in the mission? If, if your goal is to clothe or feed the homeless, you actually have a measure which says how much money and clothes and whatever were donated to us and how many people did we clothe? How many people did we give homes? And they have an incentive in order to get more donations, in order to get reputation and in order or to government grants. feel good. Or government, yeah. <laughs> then they, they will, they actually have a real incentive to try to do the best with that money. What incentive, if any, do you believe the government has to, to do the most efficient job they can? What incentive does the state have to put the most people uh, into homes, to clothe the most people? Well, I think when people have successful uh, economic lives and are stable, um, it's better for crime. It's better for our economy. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a ton of good. There's not any kind of direct incentive. Right. But nonprofits have that same incentive. So nonprofits want to actually have the goal be succeeded because they think it'll make a better world. It's not just for that their goal, but if a nonprofit says, I want to house people and also it'll cut down on crime, that's also their goal, but they have a unique incentive. So my, my, yeah, my posit to you, what I would suggest to you is that the thing that government can do that the probably the only argument that a progressive can make that it, that makes the government more effective than a nonprofit the government has the ability to use force whereas the nonprofit doesn't the the government has the ability to take the money from you to do this stuff the nonprofit has to actually convince you they're doing a good job in order for you to do it well, if the world wildlife I, fund was actually setting fire to the forest i wouldn't donate to them but but the, my, old, the, the old EPA WWF. gets to take money from me either that's way a, that's a bold yeah. statement for it. Um, <laughs> I would yeah. not donate to them if they burned down the forest. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say I wouldn't either. But I yeah. still have to pay my taxes even when uh, that that poor community has the, the water pollution. Um, no, that, that's fair. And I see I take your point. Again, I don't view it as force when the government, you know, uses tax ta- uh, taxes people and then spends it on other programs. Um, things like. Uh, public housing. I mean, th- this is how, you know, like even in terms of in capitalist terms, public housing plays a large role in Singapore. It plays a large role in, in Hong Kong. I mean, re- the re- redistributing wealth, uh, it kind of invigorates capitalism to a certain extent because it gives people more money to spend. Demand goes up. Um, and I think there's a lot of there's a lot to be said about the government having a role in that uh, redistribution rather than it relying on people who have expendable income and want to give it. Because, frankly, not all people with expendable income want to give it. Some people with a lot of expendable income want to buy a yacht or something like that. And I'm not I'm not I'm not trying to bash so they, people they that own be, yachts. They need to be they need to be forced to give we their need, money. We need to seize everyone's yachts. That's what I'm trying to say. No, <laughs> right. I'm not trying to say that. Seize the but, yachts platform. Yeah, exactly. Right. You're seizing the means of. Uh, of boating. Yeah, exactly. Oh, um, wow. So, yeah. That's, that's Ford, normally... Ford, Ford gets what we're doing here. Yeah, yeah that's, yeah, that's normally what, my, that's normally what my joke. At. That's this normally is, my do joke. Do you have like a little like embedded bit of like communist literature and yeah, like, yeah, what yeah. you're trying to tell people? Look, it's I'll, my job I'll, to I'll, call I'll, you out. I'm just, I'm just saying all history here to Ford is the history of class struggle. <laughs> so, uh, Ford, you know, Ford it's, it's, a very, it's a very well-known fact that uh, the gears of capitalism are old by the blood of the workers. But, uh... no. Why did I sign up for this? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I don't know either. But uh, you know, I do want to move on just because we're getting – yeah, we, we're going to move on to robots. This is what I've been waiting for the whole time. Uh, so we're concerned here at Future Left about future things like robots. And uh, so automation could play a big role in the economy in the, in the next few years. Some people say right. you know, in, in the next one or two decades, it could kill 50 percent of jobs. Others say uh, you know, 33 percent. Some say, oh, it'll just eliminate certain tasks. 
tasks. It'll eliminate 10% of jobs. I believe that one day we'll have, uh, you know, super intelligent machines that just replace all work. I, 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 I'm going to go out. I think that'll happen one day. Casey hates that idea. He thinks it's stupid. It probably is stupid. But uh, no, I know. the commies want that because then they don't have to work and they get all the free stuff. Absolutely. You're absolutely. Right. You're right. We do. We but, do want that. But, uh, you know, um, this is this is kind of a, uh, an interesting question for me. I want uh, robot pediatricians. And, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Right. I'd, lo- I'd love to have a robot operate my kid. Robots like make less mistakes. So, uh, yeah. Sure. Bring it. Right. Um, but no, I mean, so in terms of like the, the labor force, how do you, how do you view you know an increase in automation and what does that mean for a, a society with perhaps less work and less um, occupations for for working class people? Right. So this is something of a Republican talking point here, but I'll say it anyway, which is that often the government contorting the free market causes um, consequences like this. So the the big example right now is uh, yesterday I went to Panera, Panera Bread, and I got a uh, like a breakfast sandwich thing. And I didn't order it from a human. I ordered it from uh, a little machine. You walk in, you use the touch screen and you pay and stuff. And, you know, a a human still had to cook it and a human still had to bring it over (laughs) to me at my table. Damn. Yeah, for now. Uh, but eventually, Damn you know, humans. they're just going to 3D print my egg sandwich. And there you go. Show up Absolutely. Uh, you have a 3D so, printer loaded with eggs. <laughs> right. And then you're going to have the printers actually printing the eggs in the first place. And so wow. then you're going to have some kind of like a chicken genocide. What came first, the anymore. printed chicken or the printed egg? Yeah, that's uh, a good question. But so, the, <laughs> I, I don't know that tampering with the free market leads. To, I mean, leads to automation. I feel like if people could have automated away their labor costs, they would have done so anyway. Sure. So automation. I think is happens faster, right? The, somebody will automate when the right. cost of automation is less than the cost of the labor that they're automating. If you increase the cost of labor, and we're going to assume for this that the cost of robots will always go down, that basically the same electronic costs half the price in three years, the cost of robots will go down. So inevitably, you will have robots replace certain labor. If you increase the cost of the labor, that will inherently happen faster. So I'm talking yeah. about speed here. Not but, whether or not it will be automated. Yeah, but that's fine with me. I'm I'm pro robot. I love robots. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, I, I, yeah, <laughs> like, like we already established earlier, I want to seize everyone's yacht, and then I don't want to work. I want all the robots to do all the work to fix my yacht that I stole. And so, right. um, <laughs> so I I don't have a problem with robots. But the the problem is, it seems to me the problem becomes who owns the robots? Um, because who owns the robots? Who owns the robots? We got. <laughs> well, also, are also, we getting into? Well, uh, let me ch- let me back up uh, real quick. Ford, what, what do you what do you think about the ability of automation to eliminate um, toil? So I, I, I want to make sure that I understand your question. So the thing that you're driving at is if we automate away people's jobs, then then people with low skilled jobs don't have the ability to get those jobs anymore. Is that the basic question or issue? Yeah, yeah. It's, it seems to me that that's that's going to be the case. And even not just unskilled, but it's um, you know people that like even like paralegals could have their jobs replaced by artificial intelligence that's that's better at, at searching through legal yeah. precedents than they are. And, and Adam, are we operating under the uh, under the idea that working is bad? I, th- I mean, it's not that I think working is bad. It's just if you, if you can avoid stupid labor, that's good. Like, like for instance, working at Panera Bread. No offense. That's, you know. <laughs> Jeez, you're probably, yeah. Panera Bread. Lost a listener. Yeah, yeah right look, there. look. Those people, those people are artists, Adam. Look, Panera Bread, they're, Panera, they're, they're, they're friends of the show, uh, but uh, sadly, <laughs> no. Great communist co- uh, company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. No, I'm, su- I'm surprised to hear you say that. That's a, so You had a separation there from Marx, who thought that the value of stuff was just based on how much money or how much labor you put into it. Mm. So if I just dig and dig a hole for 24 hours, then it's as valuable as me making a, anything else for 24 hours. Hours. Absolutely, but, it is. no. It's just, <laughs> no, 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 that's a horrible living hell. <laughs> if I dug a hole for twenty four hours, you, I'd have nothing more than my dead corpse in a hole. So I don't, I don't know. <laughs> right. Also, Marx. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's uh, crude, but okay. The, uh, <laughs> so that's how we do it here. <laughs> okay, but so here's my actual answer to it, which is that I think you could probably see this as the same concern of any society with any new technology we had a right. technological re- revolution you know 
uh, in the 1900s, even right. before that, right? You wouldn't, we wouldn't look back now and say, I wish that tractors weren't invented because they cut down on the labor cost of people yeah. manually doing that same labor. And so similarly, the internet has replaced a, a ton of different goods for which there was labor, right? right. Why, you know, you don't, you don't need to print as many books. And so there's all the people involved in book printing. You yeah. don't need to print as many newspapers. So, so same to that. Basically, every time we have a new technology, it's completing some kind of a task, uh, often that somebody else used to do, and now they're not doing it. Uh -huh. But once that thing is implemented, we don't look back and wish that we could get rid of it. We wouldn't get rid of the internet so that people could uh, replace the tasks that, uh, you know, sure. the internet huh. had. May maybe we would briefly have a greater employment level if the internet just stopped working, but I don't think anyone would consider that a net positive for society. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not suggesting that, the like, again, like, I'm, pr I'm pro-robot, but, uh, and, <laughs> but uh, t taking your point, looking back, you know, there was the famous Luddite movement that was led by some guy whose last name was Luddite which is unfortunate but he went in and he started breaking up all the the, the looms for like you know, textiles yeah so for looms he started breaking those up and because he was like nah I use my hands you're gonna unemploy me which is adorable but you know I, I'm, I, I'm not I'm not suggesting this argument as like oh man we gotta we gotta make sure people are still making shirts with their hands that's not yeah. what I'm about yeah see Ford, we're, we're not we're not saying that people won't be able to do these jobs anymore we're saying we're saying they won't have to do this yeah they won't right. need to but why is that a problem? Is is it a problem because, because they aren't going to get the wages that they would have? Yeah, it's it's a problem because there will be less jobs, less opportunity for people to make an income right. because there won't be as many jobs available. It'll lead to a pretty and as far as I can tell, a, very, a much more entrenched and a wider gap between the rich and the poor. There's a lot of reasons that I that I'm concerned about. And actually, one guy was like, um, who thought he had a solution. I thought I found it rather crude though. He was like, you know, we'll just all end up being our Artisans will be ballet dancers and jesters for the people that own robots. I mean, his, ar his argument was a little more nuanced than that, but that's how I interpreted it because I'm terrified. Yeah, the robots that's can't exactly, do art yet. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's exactly okay. how Republican. That's exactly how like super conservative people define like if you're like, oh, let's make college more uh, affordable. Then everyone's just going to be dancing women's studies majors. <laughs> yeah, I applied for I that job. A hell in a handbasket. I was yeah. a film major and I'm doing okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you dare. Dirty hippie. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was a religious Don't you hate it when you go to your parents, tell them you have a dream, and they're like, yeah, how are you going to sell your labor, though? And you're like, oh, right. God, come yeah, on, Dad. Well, <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, that's great. I heard there's a new women's gender and sexuality studies factory opening up. Down yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, and you go, really? And they go, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Yeah. Uh, damn patriarchy, then they say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> As we the, um, what was my answer to that? Okay, yeah, so circling back. I think that it's true that generally, in order to preserve or increase profits, people will do more automation. I think that we'd... Yeah, uh, agree with that. Profits, however, in the absence of force, in the absence of, of a government or of a state granted monopoly or anything like that, profits signify the creation of value. The reason why Panera can make profit when they have their automated character is because they've created value for me that right. now I can go buy this egg sandwich. When you create value for society, I think you do open up the um, the world to more jobs, jobs that either don't exist now or you're freeing up labor to go do other things. In a, if we're speaking about America right now in the short term, we have a lot of people that want to get into this country and not as many people that want to get out, which is why we have a bunch of people uh, illegally immigrating. And the, by the way, side note, the libertarian argument would generally be let them. But the reason Yay. for that is because we have a need for labor. They come here not because of our welfare system. They come right. here because they want to do jobs. They want to provide their labor. Yeah. If, if we're at such a situation where people from other countries are coming because they know that they can come here and get employed, then we then there are jobs. So there are, there are jobs that people would end up doing if they weren't applying for positions that could be replaced by robots. My my argument would be that if you if you have the that lower end cut off by robots, you're going to have people end up with better positions than that. And that the robots themselves probably with that bring more jobs themselves. It's not like the robots are building themselves, uh, coding themselves, All, right? Yet. Although. Yet. although. No, no, uh, th that's, <laughs> yeah. that's the premise of the science fiction novel I'm writing. Uh, no, yeah. but um, <laughs> it's my screenplay. No, no, I see, I see what you're saying. I just, uh, I, I get a sense that... Um, you know, Adam gets uh, gets a sense that he really likes robots. I, yeah, I just yeah. love them. I just love them. They seem neat. We can be friends. <laughs> uh, but 
No, I, I worry that like it'll displace people. Of course, there are going to have to be you know really like really good engineers that that maintain various robots that have various tasks. But I, I get a sense that, for instance, the World Economic Forum, and I'm, I don't mean to like just drop ooh, drop some stats or whatever, but uh, the World Economic Forum projected that by 2020 the global economy would lose seven million jobs to automation, but it would gain two million more. Now that's great, but in my mind, that's a five mil- that's five million jobs net loss. And I'm not saying that other technologies won't appear that create more jobs. It just it just seems to me that the trend, um, and this and this is what is different from you know uh, the the loom or the like the advent of the internet is that the trend is is going to be um, very much it seems to me from here on out down. You know maybe maybe you're right that the, the fifteen dollar minimum wage thing it's leading to more automation. Maybe the actual worthy fight for fifteen is a fifteen hour work week. I don't know, but. Uh, it, it seems to me that that there it is with the commies who don't like labor again. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. This, this, this is what Marx had wrong. He. he uh, you know. He, he, well, he had a lot wrong. If we're being honest. But he had all of it wrong. Yeah. Ooh. Well. 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 Uh, he had a pretty pretty sick beard. He was. The, so did Thoreau. Who? Oh, hey. I've never heard of him. No, he, didn't Thoreau have You've like a the we- David Thoreau. No, I have. I'm kidding. Uh, but but didn't he have like <laughs> you? Didn't he have like chops? I thought Henry David Thoreau had like some chops. Oh, the, you're looking at the younger when he was when he was older. He had a he had a full beard. I, I almost <laughs> called it a Marx beard, but that, I wouldn't want to. That's how you have respect. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. how you had respect in the 19th century yeah. as you as you had. <laughs> It's weird that Henry David Thoreau uh, grew a beard right, right, uh, right around the Russian Revolution. No, I'm kidding. That didn't happen. <laughs> but uh, uh, okay, I'll historically explain. not accurate. And, yeah. But uh, also, but I it's, don't like but the it's a, but it's or a pot- how do you feel about yeah. Alex Jones, uh, the great libertarian oh. thinker, Alex Jones? <laughs> Uh, you've already misdefined him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, I, if you want my actual, I actually, so a former intern at News to Share, I, and I won't name him because this would be embarrassing to Steve. You know who you are, me, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> Steve asked me, uh, like, what do you think of Alex Jones? I'm trying to find some other news outlets that I can follow. I was like, don't do it. It's a yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, the trend. Uh, yeah. uh, anyway, uh, Steve, I mean, Steve lives under a bridge is, now. Yeah. Right. My actual opinion is that I think that he uh, takes advantage of people who are so disenfranchised and then makes them believe crazy stuff. Yeah. Disenfranchised people can find alternative politics. They can find their own reasoning and solutions, telling them things that are just patently false, like the chemtrail stuff and 9-11 inside, jo- like yeah. all of the, that. I think that's hugely dangerous. And I think it really hurts the legitimacy of the yeah. libertarian movement. No, I, I agree. And I actually do think that's something that the left has wrong right now is that, um, uh, and I think it was written about in Jacobin magazine, which is probably not something you read often. But uh, <laughs> but but it was it was basically suggesting that like people have been criticizing Sanders because he gets mostly white votes. That's true. Um, uh, he didn't he doesn't do as well with uh, with voters of color. Um, but um, at, at the same time, the left is often very quick to dismiss um, white working class Americans as like you know rural country bumpkins that aren't right. a part of the working class that we're trying to save which i think which i think is a big problem with the left and i i think that that people like donald trump and people like alex jones really tap in and exploit those people that are marginalized and i because say the left is dropping know, the ball oh, because, because the because the left views them as you know these people they just want guns and they want to they want to hate gay people and, well, and that, you know that's that's why they're they're only left with things that go against their self-interest that, that they're only left with uh yeah with with yeah. you know ranting about what really one of, happened on 9-11. One of the funniest quotes from Trump was when he won, I forget which state, but he actually said out loud the words, we love the poorly educated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. And boy, doesn't he. Yeah. <laughs> and boy, does he, yeah. All right, yeah. well. I, let, let's move on because we're 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 going probably over time. This is a lot of fun though. Uh, foreign policy. All of us here. I think all of us here are kind of uh, as a rule opposed to war. There are only a few scumbags on earth that are just like, yeah, war's awesome. We should do that. Um, <laughs> Dick Cheney. What? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's the first time anyone mentioned Dick Chain on the podcast. I'm not happy for it. I'm not happy. I got to tell you. I, I don't think that was a po- that wasn't like, uh, yes, I'm on your podcast to officially endorse uh, Dick Cheney for president. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can you can endorse him for president in, in 3016 because that fucker ain't going to die ever. But uh, 16. Yeah. Uh, so on, mixtape drop. He'll have had <laughs> heart attacks by then. 3,016 yeah. 3, heart attacks. Yeah, only, only the good die young. Sorry to say. They just, but uh, just keep shooting people and taking their heart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, so 
I, I watched the, the the libertarian debate and I was kind of stunned at, at the uh, w- one question in particular. I was I, I thought it was weird that it was a question like would you have intervened in World War One or World War Two? It was and there were, I think there were more com- <laughs> components to the question. A lot of people said I said said no or not a lot. There's only five of them I think, but but uh, they some of them said no. Uh, Gary Johnson, the nominee, said I don't know. Um, even <laughs> even among even among um, you know people like me who are like oh war's bad and feeling. Um, I, I, when it comes to like World War II, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, we gotta, and, and not even the Pearl Harbor thing. I think Gary Johnson specifically said we were attacked, we have the right to defend ourselves, and I think most of them said we have the right to defend ourselves. Um, sure. But um, but even in, in the case of like you know the Holocaust, like do we have, or even now in Syria where there's this massive civil war, all the blowback, do we have a, a duty to protect? Is often uh, what's what's used in uh, you know the quote unquote liberal international order. I think that it comes down again to the non-aggression principle which basically says I don't have the right to initiate force or aggression it's difficult so in something like Syria when you have uh, human rights abuses going on there does the yeah. US have a right to get involved as they're hurting their own people most most libertarians and probably most progressives would generally say no yeah. that at least as insofar as we're talking about the state we do not I have a fr- I have a friend who has a who founded actually a nonprofit and their entire nonprofit is sending women's sanitary products to Syrian refugees. Um, that's an intervention that's positive, and it's also private. It's not done by the by the government. When the government get, intervenes, often so the consequentialist answer is often the government intervention tends to make it worse. When when we have two really uh, uh, bad sides in Syria. Um, it's pretty difficult for us to intervene with anything other than food, water, etc., and not have a negative outcome. Obviously, the United States is not going to be pro-Assad, but if we if we take down Assad, ISIS will rule Syria. It is a is a prediction. Yeah, so, I don't, I, it's not one I buy, but but yeah, I mean, but I get what, but I get what you're argument. saying. Yeah, yeah, and, I get what you're saying. And and most people would agree that that to, generally speaking, toppling dictators can end up with with even worse. A uh, uh, rule that yeah, most people I mean, would agree with that here, that ISIS here's my perspective a, yeah. on that. Um, like mm-hmm. typically, even after like Gaddafi falls here or uh, Saddam goes away in Iraq, and then there's those like years of calamity. That's often because they've designed a system that cannot exist without them. You know, it's a system built on abuse. There's a lot of aggression, uh, a lot of aggression, uh, the principles of, of aggression going on in these countries. Um, the, and, uh, you know, I think these people kind of, these dictators, they hollow out their societies. And then when they're gone, sometimes they just die of natural causes as uh, the guy in Algeria, which is kind of like, uh, you might not know about Algeria, but it's basically uh, uh, weekend at Bernie's. Uh, <laughs> the, the, guy, the guy is going to die. Uh, he may already be dead. And they're just kind of they carting just keep him around. Him up. Yeah, exactly. There's going to be instability there. There's going to be there, there's instability when these people are removed by force. So and it's at like a certain drug point, addiction. it's like a drug addiction. There's this harmful thing, and yeah. when you when you stop like, it cold turkey, there's right. going to be a lot of blowback. There's going to be a lot of sure. withdrawal symptoms. And, and I know that a lot of liberals and a lot of left people don't like it when I say like you know sometimes you gotta you gotta put your foot in someone's ass every now and then, um, or put uh, a knife in someone's ass, a la Gaddafi. Yeah, that's what happened to Gaddafi. That that, that, that helps me. Sleep sleep at night knowing that you know there's justice in the world <laughs> that bad people get stabbed in the ass until they're dead right. you know what i mean but right so so we probably agree that on a, on a couple of things so we'll start with the common ground the common ground is we know that the united states has the right to defend itself at least yeah, when when someone sure. does aggression against it we also know that in an oppressive dictatorship regime i i assume you would say that the the people have a right to fight back against that that the people have a right to take out the people of syria have a right to fight back against Assad, the people of of Iraq, had a right to fight back against uh, Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Um, So the question is, should the U.S. be involved? Yeah. And my feeling is that if if we haven't been aggressed upon as a country, I don't know that we actually have the right to, to get involved. I also don't know that we have the right, again, realizing that how much it takes out of our our people when we fund these wars they're extremely yeah. expensive they hurt our economy um when gross domestic product uh increases because we're building guns and missiles and stuff those things don't increase quality of life that's not value there's not sure. more prosperity when we when we create weapons for use overseas um so i think that it, it has it 
pretty much always has a negative effect on us. So so it's sort of an aggression onto the people of the United States in order to try to fight aggression overseas using uh, well, more aggression. And this might be kind of consequentialist, but like, it, it, especially in Syria, for, well, we, are, we have been attacked by a certain actor in Syria, not the Syrian government, obviously, although I think I, I blame the, ri- the, the rise of ISIS on the Assad government. That's my own yes, perspective. I agree. Um, if it, the the problems in Syria uh, very well could spread to Jordan, which is not a very strong state, Lebanon, and and like these problems tend to spread. Um, and the right now there there are I think a, a million or so Syrian refugees that have gone to Europe and are causing a lot of problems there. A lot oftentimes, at the very least, leading to um, you know the rise of right wing anti immigrant governments. And th- there are so many consequences that it, I do believe it will harm us if we stay stay out of it. And the the question of how much it takes out of our country, I you know I I do believe in a multilateral intervention with partners so that you know there's no reason that United States should have to go around the world doing everything by itself. It's silly. But I do I do believe that the United States has a role in the world, particularly a leadership role due to its power and its capacity to affect change. I'll let you jump in. Oh, well, hold on. I wanted to ask for, for one one thing uh, that, that tags onto this so you can probably combine the answers. I wanted to know if you thought it was a fallacy to reduce this to uh, on a micro level to seeing someone being um, being attacked or mugged not on your property so you're not being affected mm-hmm. do you think that if you had the ability to step in and stop this so on a person to person level would you also hold the same principles that you hold on an international level of non-intervention uh, I think that there's an imp- so first of all I do think that somebody has the right to stop an aggression that they uh, that they see I th- so yes if somebody is being mugged outside my house and I witness it uh, I have the right to do there are two different things I can do first one is I can call the police which is a th- which is a third party yeah um, uh, into it or or I could try to intervene myself and I consider both of those moral I consider both of those uh, justifiable and and I may even consider them responsibilities okay. um, when you t- when you talk about when you use that to then sell a neoconservative foreign policy uh, and you say, well, we should intervene when when people are doing this and that overseas, um, I think it gets dicier largely because uh, we have to use, again, the institution of of, gov- of government to do that in the first place. I, the, the example I would give on on foreign entanglements that don't involve us is that it's justified for individuals if they want in the united states to go to uh iraq and help the um the kurds fight isis and and people do that there are a lot of military veterans uh who are now joining uh various uh militias mercenary groups etc to go to go fight isis uh and defend the yazidis the the kurdish people um basically joining the peshmerga um I think that that's basically justified. I don't think that the state has the right to stop them. Whether or not we should actually be involved uh, is a, is a totally different question. And I think because we we do not have a uh, purely sort of voluntarily created military, and that's not going to happen. I do want to point out Daryl Perry uh, said that we should fund the the military with donations and bake sales, and that was a little, <laughs> that was really stupid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a Methodist, like a Methodist church, <laughs> right? <laughs> Right. And I, what I think his point was, wasn't that literally we should try to do that, but sure. that the military should be so small because who would, basically people wouldn't donate to it unless it was necessary. So there, there's, there's a little bit of legitimacy that he was driving at, but he said it in such an extreme way that I think he lost the whole audience. But yeah, yeah. Um, I think he really lost the audience when he punched his podium. That was terrifying. <laughs> yeah. So there was the, him punching his podium. He also, I don't know how much this showed up on the screen, but like I was there in person and his veins were kind of like sticking out of his forehead sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so intense. The Probably the most funny part and I'd, I'd refer I'd tell people to see this so many libertarian pretty much all libertarians agree with auditing or ending the Federal Reserve mm-hmm. but uh, Daryl Perry actually like took money out of his pocket and he like tore it up on stage and was going end the Fed <laughs> Um, that's a felony, <laughs> mister. That is a felony. Right, right. While tearing apart the... That, that was the exact point. He's like, look, I'm committing civil disobedience uh, on C-SPAN. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> Watch out. We got a badass over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> badass, folks. No, um, 
that up right. alert. But anyways, the military itself is is force, and so minimizing it generally is minimizing force. The justified yeah. use for it is if it is in defense of of our country. Um, I definitely spend- agree that we should reduce spending. I think there are probably right. a lot of in, uh, like insignificant military bases around the world or that don't mean as much as they used to. For a lot of places, people really do want Americans to stay there for uh, various geopolitical reasons. But I don't have a problem with opening the door to a debate about reducing our presence around the world. For, for it, I, I want to bring I want to bring sort of an anecdotal. I, I know I know you probably had a larger point, but I wanted to get this in while we're talking about this particular topic. Mm-hmm. Generally, as a as a as a person on the left, it seems that we often agree with libertarians that we should respect the sovereign, the sovereignty of other countries and not get involved, not impose our, our will on them. But when you're talking about the intention for, for these things, it often seems like the liberal intention is because we should respect them. And it often seems like the libertarian uh, or like I said, very anecdotally, like and this is people that I know. I know it's not official policy. Right. But it often seems like a lot of libertarians I know are like, we shouldn't interfere with these other countries because fuck other countries. Yeah, right, because it's language. none of our business. No. Uh, well, not only that it's not in any of our business, but just because they are not they are not us. Yeah. And uh, so they don't matter because they're not like, like this very isolationist sort of thing. Right. Well, OK, so all libertarians universally condemn the word isolationist. Donald Trump is an isolationist. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, libertarians you almost always use the term uh, non-interventionalist. Uh, an isolationist, I think, is somebody who, first of all, may isolate us by having a very active foreign policy. Right. You can't do trade. You can't. You're isolating from people when you uh, commit wars abroad. It's also when you try to restrict trade and literally building a wall on the southern border, you know, inherently, I think, right. matches the definition of isolationists. When you talk about libertarians, okay. they usually say we're the opposite of isolationists because we actually want there to be a free exchange of goods and services uh, between countries. It's isolating when we have government policy picking winners and losers and trying to spread their influence around the world and particularly as it relates to to trade, so I would say with something nice like siren this, there. <laughs> sorry, right. sorry, sorry, guys, that's the government coming for me. Right, God, yeah, God, yeah. goddamn government. <laughs> right. I think that it's probably similar, to, more so, to the issue that you just said of poverty, which is that libertarians don't say, "Oh, screw the poor," because it's not our problem. They say we think we have free market solutions to this. In terms of the international playing field, I think it's a little bit harder to say something like that as it relates to foreign states as well. But when you talk about human issues that are going on internationally, there are voluntary nonprofits that that deal with those things. My World Wildlife Fund donation that I just referenced uh, was actually uh, specifically to help koala bears in Australia. I'm all for it. All, all for it, right? And, and like I said, I have a friend who has this um, uh, a nonprofit that specifically deals with providing feminine hygiene products to uh, right. women in Syria. That organization is called Half of Humanity, um, and so, th- so I would, I would say that it is not isolationist to say I think that our contributions to the world shouldn't be with military force, but that we can allow our people to help however they can. Again, I, I'm not necessarily saying that churches are net positive or anything or that I'm even endorsing religion, but that churches actually have a lot of international uh, mission sure. trips. Yeah. Like the government, the government doesn't often get involved just because they're doing it out of the gun- goodness of their heart. The United States government is trying to be like a world a uh, uh, police state, right? We try to influence policy in in all of these different countries I mean, and spread our influence. It's not just out of the goodness of our heart that we have a bunch of military bases in no, in South Korea and yeah. on the borders all no, around I, Iran. I'll definitely admit that, that that the international development is a diplomatic tool. Um, uh, so, like with USAID, well, as, as are often miss, mission trips. Uh, Right, well, but at least they can do it voluntarily. What sure, I was about absolutely. to concede that exact thing, which is that yeah. mission trips, they can go and they can say, we're going to give you food. We hope you read this Bible. But but they don't get to point a gun at somebody and say, eat this sure. food and read this Bible. <laughs> absolutely. Sure. Yeah, that's what uh, well, it'd be I'm interesting if the, it's. <laughs> 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 no, it'd, it'd be interesting be if good. that if that's what USAID did. But but USAID, <laughs> the, I mean, they, their programs like go to like go to different parts of the world. And, uh, you know, um, whether it's you know about literacy, whether it's about supporting small businesses with microloans and stuff like that. I mean, the, it's not that I don't think that, that markets will would be interested in doing that. Be, but when 
the government, at least in, in places like sub-Saharan Africa that are conflict af- conflict affected, uh, a lot of businesses, they're not interested in going there and like, you know, yeah, let's support entrepreneurs in, in fucking Angola. Um, but when you go there and you have a lot of capital being injected, for better or worse, you might have, we might say, you know, uh, it's, it's aggressive to take it from, there's aggression to take it from Americans and give it to, uh, in one form or another, to, uh, to programs in Angola or whatever. But um, uh, it, it, it's it's good for the United States and it's good for our partners around the world in strengthening and, and stabilizing regions, um, not not in, in a stability in a sense of like oh now now there's a dictator here and things will quiet down, but like stability as in like uh, a place that has successful markets or has a uh, rational government uh, or a stronger middle class around the world, things like that. Um, are, are, part, are a significant part of our right. development strategy. Um, what I would posit is the same thing that I said about poverty here, which is that the government doesn't have an incentive to do all of those things as efficiently as possible. And I think as we talk about foreign policy, that's particularly important to note. More than half of basically the government's spending is is on foreign policy, be it military, uh, be it caring for the vets once they come back home. Um, all, all in our foreign policy is basically half of, of, of the entire government. Um, yeah. This is a behemoth of a of a um, institution. Right. Um, they don't they don't have an incentive to to cut down on costs on those things or just make their costs go as far as they can. And we see this with with you know military contracts buying all kinds of, of military equipment. They bought so much military equipment that now they're giving it to the local police forces because they have more military stuff than they even know what to do with. Yeah. Um, those those guns aren't creating any value for for people overseas. So I don't I don't think. That that they have the same incentive, whereas a nonprofit who who actually has an interest in helping in some specific area with some specific topic, we're helping refugees in Syria, we're helping LGBT people in Africa who are who are marginalized in some way. They have an actual incentive to make their dollar go the furthest to to help the people who need it. All right, so I think this is. I mean, we need to transition to the next one, but I think this sure. is an, this is an easy uh, segue. Um, uh, not like the stupid thing people ride, but like a transition. Um, so, uh, with regard to social policy, stuff like healthcare and education, my question is always: Should these things really be privatized? Aren't there some industries that we shouldn't be that, that profit shouldn't be the thing motivating their function? And uh, so, you, you, you suggested, and you even suggested earlier that, uh, that, that the the government doesn't have the same incentives. Um, but in terms of social policy, we do have to draw a line somewhere. Um, so, does a publicly funded firefighting force do they not have the same incentive if there was a profit driven firefighting force or a police force like if i had to have if i had to pay dues to my local police department or their comp- competing police department um wouldn't there be a, a, a similar incentive structure or is that or is profit in these sectors is that inappropriate Right. So uh, my opinion is, and so I know plenty of uh, anarchists or volunteerists who say we should privatize everything. And so they have different structures Yuck. for how they believe no. in, in privatizing <laughs> police and prisons. I don't agree with that. I don't yeah. think, I think yeah. that, that violates the map. So here, here's my, my concept. If, if, if we define government, you probably would not agree with this definition of government. But if you, but some theorists would define government as a uh, monopoly on force within a geographic area. Max Weber. Uh, I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing. <laughs> um, so it's if if the non-aggression principle is to say that basically you can't initiate force, the legitimate role of government, an institution of force, is actually to prevent force and then do whatever kind of enforcement is necessary for that. So I do think that it is morally wrong for there to be a profit incentive for policing and and criminal justice. I think that private prisons probably are are unlibertarian because they rely on force in order to operate. They're, they're inherently cronious by nature. It's impossible to have an objective, uh, uh, non-profit-driven uh, private prison, you know, as, and they are for-profit. Um, yeah. 
I think so. So in terms of police departments and and all these things, I think generally there's always benefit in greater localization. You pretty much see historically that the federalization of police forces is basically how how fascism happens. In the in the opposite direction, we basically don't have federal police other than so for example FBI and things like that. But that's not the police that you deal with on a daily basis. Right. We have state police and then we have local police. Generally, pushing towards localization is positive because you have the money closest to the person who's paying it. From my small town that I used to live in in Massachusetts, it was Boxford, Massachusetts. We had a population of 8,000, which is, which is very small. I basically knew all of the police officers in that town and the voting that happened on various budgets and things like that. We'd have maybe 400 people at best uh, show up to vote. So my vote actually did make a difference. You can say that dem democracy is tyranny of majority and blah, blah, blah. But the closer it gets to the individual, the more local it is. I think the less of an issue you have there. Right. Uh, well, let me ask you that. Well, yeah. let me ask you that. Just, just uh, you mentioned localization. What, what about areas in perhaps the deep south uh, where localization of laws is going to mean the institution of of uh, certain laws that are racial, uh, racially based, that right. are biased against certain minority groups. I mean, when you have local laws being made that don't sort of match the ethos or the supposed ethos of the nation at large, um, isn't that a problem? Well, this is actually the distinction we were talking about before. The, that, that kind of a law isn't an issue be because the majority of the country says so. That kind of law is, is an issue because inherently uh, a racially discriminatory law is wrong. It's not just because the country says so. Pre-Civil Rights Act, if you had half of people that would have disagreed with the Civil Rights Act, they're, they're still wrong even if the majority are against civil rights. No, I was just, I was, the only reason so I So you're saying in a local community, national... what, if you, what if you have the majority of people in a local community in the extreme vote in favor of, who, who of segregation? <laughs> yeah, I think exactly. I think we have a constitution that basically says you, you can't do that. And so the role of, for example, we haven't mentioned the Supreme Court yet, but the role of the Supreme Court should be to say what any uh, government under its jurisdiction is capable of doing. A local okay. government cannot pass a regulation that, that blatantly violates the First Amendment. And some have tried. You, you have had local ordinances attempting to criminalize swearing. I have seen that. Um, yeah. And that, does, that doesn't fuck that. pass. But right, there's fuck that. But there's, exactly. certain, but there's certain laws that, that, that obfuscate it using Using, you know, clouded language or like 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 voter registration uh, right. or, or things like that. We know those are often used to create racial or communal imbalance in uh, voter turnout. Right. I um, think that and, that and that can often pass because it's not overtly in its language. It's not overtly racial. I think the exact same issue happens on the federal level and it's harder to fight. The larger the government institution that we're talking about is, the harder it is to, to fight. On my local level, I've I've voted in favor of a of building a new library in my town, we were within four votes on it. Individual votes matter at that level. Um, yeah. And individual voices really matter. On, on, a, on a federal level, when you do have an institutionalized issue like that, it's so much more solidified. I would rather that the federal government try to make sure that all of the sub-governments, when you have uh, districts, towns, cities, uh, states, that those are subject to its laws that stop them from hurting people's rights. But if you do have individual ordinances like that, I think that's, that's a lot easier to fight than, than federal uh, 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 invalid law, discrimination, federal segregation. Right. So, I, your, I, so your so your model is local laws with federal oversight, basically. Yeah. Well, which is what the I mean, this is what the Constitution says, right? The the Constitution says Congress shall make no law, but uh, you know, prohibiting freedom of speech. And then there there are four others. That's not the entire First Amendment, but. Um, uh, but it's been interpreted since that then that they didn't just mean Congress. They meant there is no government institution that may violate the First Amendment right. My town police force also cannot station uh, its officers in my house because that would violate the Third Amendment. Uh, so there's so the federal government in some ways should be protecting people from even their local governments from from imposing some kind of a local tyranny. Oh, I, I guess maybe I'm missing the distinction here. I get that the Constitution for Americans, it, it, it would work that way. But what is the difference between, you know, the Congress saying, hey, you can't you can't separate people by race and the Supreme Court uh, far away in Washington, D.C., telling someone in uh, Greenbow, Alabama, where Forrest Gump was from, that you, you also can't. I get that on our on our Constitution, that's that's how it works but is that still fair that that you know the these people far removed from greenbow alabama and washington with their fancy fancy black coats or whatever and their wigs is that right. is that fair that they get to tell people uh, everywhere else how they have to live their lives 
it's sad because I don't. I mean, the Supreme Court does get it wrong sometimes, and and then when that happens, people yeah. are like, "Well, what do we do now?" Um, you got to wait for someone to die. That's what it is. Right, wait for somebody to die and then ask the question again. Or you uh, can, you know, to some degree, you can uh, accelerate that process. Wink, wink. And that and that's a frustrating <laughs> thing. My <Jesus>. my <laughs> hope would be that rather than the rather than the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, Ju- justifying the infringement of people's rights that the Supreme Court would rule in favor of of individual liberty each time that that isn't the case but sometimes you get some good ones probably the most important Supreme Court case of last year was actually uh, they declared that you can't that the federal government can't take people's raisins there were raisin farmers who in a, <laughs> in addition to Obama's always packed. trying to take my raisins. They were they were right. right. They were forced <laughs> to give up uh, a portion of of their raisins over a certain First, amount, and the Supreme Court ruled it invalid. <laughs> it starts so, with registration for it. Uh, yeah, okay, right. I think that should yeah that should be the second and a half amendment. Yeah. Yeah. Register the you have the right to bear <laughs> bear raisins. <laughs> you have the right to bear raisins. Yeah, to to maintain a well regulated a well regulated produce section, a well regulated digestive system being necessary. To the to the <laughs> function of a free human. Um, hey, <laughs> let's 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 rewrite the whole the whole the, uh, constitution. To the right to the dry grapes, grapes and keep them shall not the, be the, the bill of grape rights. Them. Yeah, <laughs> the bill of <laughs> grape rights. No, um, uh, we have gone uh, quite over time. Uh, we, there's, I feel like we could keep talking about all of this. Um, yeah. Ford, I had a great time today. Uh, we definitely want you to have we'll have you come back on. Uh, perhaps uh, once uh, I hope uh, Gary Johnson makes it into the presidential debate with a big fat 15 percent at least um but yeah and this is a conversation i think we should continue uh at the very least it was a lot of fun and i appreciate having you on today right i i will add that uh so there's gary johnson don't forget also about jill stein uh, yeah. to the to, yeah. the to the left wing who says you know i'm i like johnson but i'm not quite there he's kind of a uh, conservative on certain issues i've met now with jill stein twice um i think that if i right, were a that. If I were a left wing uh, person, if I were if I were one of you commies, no, just kidding, oh, um, Maoist. If I, if I would, yeah, if I was a gender nonconforming Maoist, yes, I would thank you. I would vote for for Jill Stein and not yeah. Hillary Clinton. Yeah, I think yes, people should generally yes, vote pretty for great. Uh, they're yeah. pretty great principles uh, yeah. rather than not that I want to start a whole nother conversation. But the, the thing that the, the, ther- the thing that terrifies me about that is that uh, you know, in a way, it's kind of exciting if you know if they if Bernie's exit you know really throws the Democrats in the disarray and his yeah. people go to Jill Stein if. All all these people yep. that are pissed off at Trump go for Gary Johnson, Holy and then we, and, and then we got like an actual like four like like semi four people semi viable in the in the in the presidential race. Um, it's it's exciting, but it terrifies me because like uh, you know I, I I'm in the same boat I think with a lot of liberals or, or le- people on the left. I don't want Donald Trump to be president so much yeah. so that I'm willing I'm willing to be like fucking fine Hillary. All right, fine. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, it's always baffling to me, Ford, whenever people, you've probably heard this too, and people are like, I don't know who's worse, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. Well, obviously, it's Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> it seems uh, very obvious. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, like I said, I didn't mean to uh, start another conversation, but that, that's an exciting prospect. Um, like I said, uh, thanks for being here today. We hope we can do this again. And oh, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, thanks for joining us today on Future Left Podcast. Be sure to visit us at futureleft.org. Ford, do you want me to plug anything for you at the end here? Uh, sure. So news to share.com. That's news. The number to yeah. uh, share.com. You can also find me on Facebook. I have my personal uh, profile, Ford Fisher, F-I-S-C-H-E-R. And then I also have a, a page. Are you on Etsy at all? No, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, we're not. A, we're, we're not on that. Team. That's like the art <laughs> thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, we well, don't have we, social <laughs> profiles on that. Thing, right? <laughs> no, no, no. We, we often start our show by going, you can follow us on Etsy, Grinder, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I get it. Airbnb. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, that was that was a bizarre inside joke that we decided to ambush you with uh, an, <laughs> yeah. uh, an hour and a half into your time. But uh, my, no, my answer was fairly earnest, though. I just, yeah. I just said, 